Growing up, you certainly had your favorite TV channel that was home to some of your favorite cartoons. Looking back on them, you probably get some serious nostalgia thinking about some of the characters that became almost family to you. Since nostalgia is such a powerful thing, it's not surprising that there have been countless reboots and copies of famous cartoons over the decades. Whether it was to appeal to a younger generation or give the previous one a taste of nostalgia, copies have been as common as cartoons themselves. However, making a successful copy is incredibly tricky. You do not want to create a total ripoff, but to borrow some characteristics of a popular cartoon and create a new one that will at least approximately appeal to fans. Though our TV screens might seem more and more saturated with ripoffs every year, the truth is that copycats have been a part of television since the very beginning, and it pains us to inform you that this includes some of your favorite childhood programs. With that said, let's have a look at 10 Worst Cartoon Show Ripoffs. The animation studio, Hanna-Barbera, had their biggest hit on their hands yet with the original 1969 release of Scooby-Doo. The cartoon followed the adventures of four teenagers and their talking Great Dane as they investigated paranormal mysteries involving supernatural demons, creatures that usually turned out to be an old guy in disguise. But there have been many outings for the world's most famous Great Dane over the years. One of them is Jabberjaw, released in 1975, which is the underwater version of Scooby-Doo swapping out Scooby Snacks for fish food. Like its predecessor, it followed around a group of young teens and their animal companions as they solved mysteries. Unfortunately, Jabberjaw only had half the appeal of Scooby and was cancelled after just one season. Tappy Toes follows Pingo the Penguin as he discovers a talent for tap dancing. Before long, Pingo's dancing skills bring him closer to Bella, who may just be the bird he needs to stop the nefarious plans of Gabby the Hermit Crab. Viewers will undoubtedly remember a similar film about a dancing penguin called Happy Feet. This one has a twist or two though. For one thing, the little penguin in this movie is raised by two strange birds that wanted him for breakfast when he was still an egg. Now Pingo is growing up and wants to fly, so the duo Luo and Buddy have to tell him that he is a non-flying bird. There are some other interesting stories lines, including one about the sea lion and crab out to get him, and one about how he saves the female penguin Bella. As far as animated mockbusters go, Tappy Toes is one of the least bad. It is far from a good movie, but unlike most other animated mockbusters, the DVD cover was really cool. Again, it attempts to do things differently to its inspiration, Happy Feet, instead of blatantly ripping it off. Surprisingly, despite its poor visual quality, it received some positive reviews for its ability to give a good laugh and its funny and relatable characters. Baby Looney Tunes features several toddler versions of those lovable Looney Tunes characters, including Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Sylvester, Tweety, and the Tasmanian Devil. The babies spend their days playing at Granny's house in the country, while each day brings a valuable new lesson, and Granny, sweet and patient as ever, is there to gently steer the little ones in the right direction if needed. But even though they're the most famous cartoon company of all time, the Looney Tunes aren't above stealing an idea or two from a like-minded franchise. Released in 2002, Baby Looney Tunes features Daffy, Porky, Tweety, and Bugs as adorable tots getting into wacky hijinks. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's the exact same concept as The Muppet Babies, which came out nearly two decades earlier. Both shows featured beloved characters as preschoolers getting into mischief, the only difference being one features a rabbit and the other features Kermit the Frog. The shows of the Disney afternoon were never tired of putting familiar characters in strange new clothes. Chippendale became private investigators, and Goofy became a suburban single dad, for example. However, this formula wore thin over the 1990s, and after limp attempts like the Mighty Ducks and Bonkers, Disney trotted out some familiar characters in the tiresome quack pack. It was a desperate attempt at recasting characters from the DuckTales and making them extraordinary. Instead of tagging along on worldwide treasure hunts, Huey, Dewey, and Louie act like characters from some inane sitcoms. They are in the center of this show with forgettable animation where their perpetually foiled adult guardian Donald Duck is being tormented by them. To say Pokemon is a massive franchise is an understatement. Since it was introduced in 1996 to adoring fans worldwide, there have been countless video games, animated series, feature films, musicals, manga, and even a theme park. Very few franchises can match Pokemon's level of success over the last two decades. The story of young Ash and his quest to become the greatest Pokemon trainer ever resonated big time with Western audiences. Pikachu, Squirtle, Meowth, and the rest of the Pokemon took the world by storm, and it didn't take long for copycats to start cropping up. Although Yu-Gi-Oh! was released right around the same time as Pokemon, Pokemon and the early chapters of the manga were original, after the massive success of that franchise, the creators decided to morph it into one of the first Pokemon ripoffs. Initially, the story was about a boy who was possessed by a mysterious gambler that used various games to defeat his opponents. Then, it morphed into the same boy using a collectible card game played by battling monsters against each other, and the other games were forgotten.
He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is one of the most popular 80s cartoons ever created. Taking advantage of relaxed broadcasting standards, it was the first show to blur the line between kids' programming and toy commercials. It was every bit as campy as the name implies, but it didn't stop anyone from falling in love with it. So, the case of calling He-Man a ripoff of Conan the Barbarian is a topic of contention, and the accusations all depend on who a person is talking to at the time. The allegations all started with an urban legend in the toy industry. That urban legend indicated that Mattel was creating a toy line for the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Conan the Barbarian, but then decided to keep the design and created their own toy line for a new original character called He-Man. During the 90s, kids loved watching a show called Dexter's Lab that centers around a young boy named Dexter, a boy genius who has a secret laboratory in his house hidden from his parents. His older sister, Dee Dee, discovered his lab, and one of her favorite things to do is destroy his creations, while Dexter's mom and dad are standard cartoon parents, silly and dumb at times, but obviously love their children. It is a witty show with humor and jokes applied to the time, and maybe still applies today. The brainchild of Gendy Tartofsky, Dexter's Lab is a quirky and creative blast filled with robots, super-powered monkeys, and giant monsters. That same brand of mischief, fun, and pathos is hard to come by, and though Johnny Test tried, it didn't exactly succeed. Not only does Johnny Test focus on child geniuses and sibling rivalry, but it basically steals the same animation style as Dexter's Lab, with several characters coming across as carbon copies. The Dragon Master Po is the kung fu teacher to a group of rambunctious kids from Panda Village, who have been imbued with mysterious and powerful chi energy. Together, they embark on incredible adventures to battle ferocious villains and become legends. This is a description of a popular cartoon called Kung Fu Panda, with nicely done graphics and animations and an exciting story. It is so popular that there is even a copy of the cartoon made in Brazil called The Little Panda Fighter. However, this is a terrible rip-off of Kung Fu Panda where the only thing in common is a panda that wants to fight. The cartoon received highly negative feedback from audiences. Like most cartoons of its kind, it lacks high-quality animation, character development, and decent soundtracks. Despite the slightly strange plot of the Powerpuff Girls, the show got pretty big. This Craig McCracken's cartoon was one of the most well-written ones on Cartoon Network during its time. Plus, adorable little girls that fight crime and kick behind are pretty cool. Since the show has a huge fan base, it's not surprising that it got a reboot and a ripoff. With a unique blend of old-school animation and sharp, satirical humor, the Powerpuff Girls became an overnight success, hitting it big with audiences and racking up six Emmy Award nominations in the process. It was a success that would prove to be hard to replicate, and as Timo Supremo proved even more challenging to rip off. Debuting in 2002 on the Disney Channel, Supremo also centered on three tiny tots with superhero powers using a similar animation style as Powerpuff, but it was never able to capture the original success, which cult status can still be felt today. Manga author Yoshihiro Togashi is no stranger to the anime and manga community. He has created arguably two of the best shonen ever to touch this earth, Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter x Hunter. He is one of the most influential authors out there, and his Hunter x Hunter was adapted into a 62-episode anime series in 1999. The show followed the life of Gone Freaks, a young kid attempting to walk in his father's footsteps by becoming a rare treasure hunter. Created by Masashi Kishimoto, Naruto focuses on a similar concept about a young ninja who has big dreams of becoming the village leader. Although Naruto follows a different arc than Gon, the show has more than a few striking similarities, especially in parallel characters like Kurapika and Sasuke, and story beats from the Hunter's Hunter exam and Naruto's Chunin exam. Kishimoto has publicly stated that Hunter x Hunter directly inspired him. ever seen. He takes guff from no one. Except the people he lets in. And their manager, Kayvon, has such an eye for organization. He'll keep their profiles growing long after they become obsolete. Yeah, the moment you've all been waiting for. It's your last chance to win tickets for their sold-out show tonight. Get those phones out because the tickets will go to the listener who can answer this question. If Chance, the lead singer of the Sensitive Thugs, could have any animal as a pet, what would it be? Hello, what's your name? This is Bubbles from Central Townsville. Chance would have a wallaby because they're sweet, but also tough. Just like the sensitive thug. 